From the studios of KENW on the campus of Eastern New Mexico University, it's You Should Know, featuring the people and events of Eastern New Mexico and West Texas. With me now is Dr. Manuel Varela, and he is a professor of biology here at Eastern New Mexico University. And um, I'm going to ask some simple questions so I understand the answers <laughs> to Dr. Varela. And um, he's going to talk with us about virus, first of all, um, because we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic, and a lot of people have a lot of questions. What is a virus? Okay, okay. Well, let's see. A virus uh, can be considered one of two things. One, it can be considered a microbe if you believe it is alive. Or you can believe it's a complex aggregate of chemicals if you believe it is not alive. Scientists don't know if it's alive or not. Mm. Now, what it is, is consists of two things. One is an internal genome made up of nucleic acid, like a DNA or an RNA, and a little shell that covers or encloses that genome and protects it. The shell is typically called a protein coat, and, and in more technical terms, a capsid. And the, the protein coat, not only it serves to protect the internal genome, but it allows it to bind to a host. Now, it's easier to explain what it has mm -hmm. than yeah. what it doesn't have. <laughs> okay. it, it, uh, a virus doesn't have cellular machinery to make energy, mm -hmm. to divide, or to multiply, same sort of a mm -hmm. thing, uh, to make more of itself. It doesn't have the ability to eat, doesn't have the ability to, to grow, on its own. So it lacks what we call cellular machinery to do all those things. Mm -hmm. So what it has to do is take that protein coat, that shell, and find a way to bind a cell and then get inside that cell to steal the cellular machinery to use it to make more of itself. So it's attached to the cell and uses the machinery from the cell, uh, does it keep that attachment as long as it's alive? No, it is very temporary. Um, the basic life cycle of a, of a virus is to bind a cell, get inside in some way, uncoat that protein shell, expose the nucleic acid in it, and then have that nucleic acid uh, uh, what, uh, do what we, what we call replication to mm -hmm. make more of itself. And then the cellular machinery is stolen to make more of those protein coats. So you make a lot of nucleic acid genomes. You make a lot of protein coat proteins. And then inside the cell, the virus assembles, packages the nucleic acid inside the protein coat. Mm -hmm. Then it may undergo some specialized maturation, uh, like uh, uh, proteases that will cleave off some of the protein parts of the, of the uh, protein coat, and then go to the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi apparatus to bring up some sugars to attach it, make a spike, and then attach those, and then exit from the cell. Sometimes a cell lives through that process. Sometimes that cell dies through that process. Whatever happens to it, it's damaged. And mm -hmm. so they call this situation a uh, cytopathic effect. So if the cell dies, then you lose a function of that cell. And if cell's damaged, you may lose a function of that cell. Okay, now you, you mentioned it can't reproduce. Uh, where do the ones that are riding on my breath, say if I have, I don't <laughs> have COVID-19, by the way, but uh, if I were to have that and and breathe out, mm -hmm. say we, we're all kind of worried about our instrumentalists mm -hmm. in the music program here and our choirs because they push out a, a lot of vapor mm -hmm. and all, riding on that vapor, our virus, mm -hmm. it is a regular virus. It's not a baby virus or something like that? What is it? 
really it, that's out there. It's it's a mature baryon. Ah, okay. Uh, and what we mean by that is that by uh, all, uh, by itself it cannot cannot make more of itself. Mm -hmm. It needs to get to a human in some way. Now we call these ways transmission. There are various modes of transmission to get from wherever it's at to the the, the human patient or the animal host. Uh, we can we can breathe it in, like with the case of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, you can it can be um, eaten. Ah. Uh -huh. You can drink it. Uh, and, and and I shouldn't say all of it. Um, mm -hmm. Many viruses can yeah. get to the human in many different ways. Uh, but breathing is the most common. Eating, drinking are two other common ways. But there's many, many ways for a virus to get to a human. And once it gets internalized into that human in some way, maybe a, um, a traumatic cut on the skin and the virus goes in there, or, mm -hmm. or, or um, you rub your, your, your eyes because you, you, somebody coughed it out or breathed it out mm -hmm. and you and it landed on something and you touched it or you picked it up and you rub your eyes or you or you you know um, touch your nose or your mouth it can you know go in in those those ways um, and then once it gets in the in, in the body it undergoes what's called a uh, initial replication mm -hmm. um, at the portal of entry wherever it enters the body it'll initially replicate just to establish a foothold and then it moves from there to its desired target organ. Mm -hmm. uh, corona seems to be the, the lungs, uh, but uh, various viruses have their target organs. Polio virus is uh, the brain, mm. hepatitis virus is the liver, uh, HIV is the white blood cell called the T cell, helper T cell. Yeah. Uh, so every, every virus has this specialized set of cells to bind to, and then get, once it gets in inside a human, now, I'm not trying to be funny, but kind of what you're saying is this thing is, it goes and gets material. It's it's like uh, Dr. Frankenstein. It takes the material and rebuilds a copy of itself. It does. It does. It absolutely does that. And, uh, and we call this process um, biosynthesis, maturation, assembly, and then once it does all of that to make mm -hmm. more of itself. It'll escape from that cell and then go on to find another cell and do the same thing all over again. So those cells that, that this virus has used are injured or broken or worse than that, and those are what cause us to be ill in terms of having a fever, mm -hmm. getting a cough, uh, uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, uh, other maybe a rash, some of these kinds of things. That's correct. Well, there's two ways for a virus to, to, to damage a person. Mm -hmm. One way is the way that you mentioned, where the cells damage and you lose its function of that specialized cell. A second way is where the virus turns your immune system, which is meant to defend you from that virus, against you. By, in the case of the coronavirus, it elicits a profound inflammation and it's too much of a, of a good thing. A mild inflammation is probably good for defensive measures, but too much of it is too much physiologically, cellularly, molecularly to, for us to handle. Uh, in the case of the coronavirus, they call it a cytokine storm, where mm -hmm. too many cytokines are made in, in, uh, in, in too large quantities. Uh, and then they mediate their physiological effects. That's too much for a human to handle, and you have to try to reduce that inflammation. So the, the lungs actually act like you have pneumonia because there's so much other material in there from, from the immune system's work. That, that's correct. Okay. Uh, it, do, uh, is there anything that can kill a virus? Do we have anything like uh, an antibiotic? Do we have an antiviral? Yes. Now, antibiotics are geared for bacteria yeah. and inhibit them. And so they don't necessarily work on a virus. But in addition to the immune system, which can defend us against viruses, there are uh, antiviral uh, chemotherapeutic agents that will target the same machinery that a virus you steals fr from us to make more of its RNA or DNA or protein. 
and inhibit those same sim uh, uh, systems. And the problem with that, though, is that these antivirals, because they're targeting our own biological uh, um, uh, systems, have profound side effects with the antivirals in particular. Mm. Now, we're looking for a vaccine at this time for the COVID-19 virus. Uh, what does a vaccine do for any of these other viruses? Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, some of the other diseases that people have caused by virus. Uh, what does it do to get rid of the virus for us okay. or to keep away the virus? Okay. Um, a vaccine, uh, well, I should say this, a, a, an attempt, to, a good vaccine okay. is one that mimics a naturally occurring infection where you survive it and are immune forever. Okay, that's the best case scenario. And a vaccine helps to circumvent that natural infectious process by just taking part of a virus, maybe a dead virus, maybe a live attenuated virus, maybe a, a toxoid component of a virus, some, some antigen that you inject into a person, the person will mount an immune response in two ways. One is what's called a humoral immunity, where it uh, builds antibodies, and those antibodies are proteins that are specifically targeted to the virus, and then neutralizes that virus in some way, maybe just by binding to it, or targeting it for oxidation, or targeting it for another immune system component, like inflammation would help to get rid of it. Antibodies recruit inflammation. Uh, uh, macrophages, uh, phagocytes, white blood cells can all come to, to, to neutralize the virus, eradicate the virus, purge the virus, inhibit the virus. Second way is what's called this, uh, cell mediated immunity. Uh, and these involve certain specialized white blood cells called T cells. And these T cells will take a cell that's been infected by a virus and kill it. Wow, very <laughs> Taking the virus along with that's it. That's what I want. No, oh, yeah, no, yeah. I don't want that. Okay, we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, can you give our local people here in eastern New Mexico some advice on how to avoid running across this virus? Mm. Coming no, let's in contact. See. Uh, stay at home, self quarantine, uh, keep six feet apart from people, wear a mask if you go in public. And if you can do those three things, uh, we could actually do some some damage to this epi to this pandemic and, okay. and thwart it. Well, thank you for being here. We're, we're going to talk. We're going to continue talking about this uh, with Dr. Michael Shaughnessy on the show and uh, but thank you for being here and I understand I think better why this why we're scared of this thing um, and uh, and we should give it some respect and I appreciate your being here thank you're you. totally welcome thank you and now I'm speaking with dr. Michael Shaughnessy he is a professor of special ed at Eastern New Mexico University, and he works also as a school psychologist, knows a lot about psychology, and the first thing I want to ask you is, um, with all this talk of COVID-19, it's on television, uh, it's the radio, they're streaming news programs about it, all of these sorts of things, how is this affecting our young people? Are children becoming afraid of this word, this COVID-19 word? Well, there's some apprehension, number one, obviously, about what's going on. It depends on the age of the student, whether it's an elementary student or a middle school or a high school student. But I think the key word is probably anxiety. There's this mm -hmm. kind of pervasive anxiety about what's going on, what's happening, uh, why do I have to wear these masks? Why is it that other people are wearing these masks? Uh, what has changed? Uh, why do we have to do this? Um, what's going to happen tomorrow? And why do mom and dad kind of feel so apprehensive and so tense? So there's this pervasive kind of anxiety about uh, this whole COVID thing. And the younger kids really don't have a good grasp 
or understanding of things like bacteria or viruses or fungi or things like that. So mom and dad just have to kind of explain, well, we don't want you to get sick. There's germs and bacteria and viruses in the air, and we want to protect you. We obviously don't want you to get sick, and obviously you and I know that we don't want them to be in the ER or the ICU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because that's a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, and can you give parents some idea of a few things, a few ways to approach a child that will make them feel a little easier? Probably three key words that I would give you or any other parent are structure, consistency, and routine. In other words, parents want to get into some kind of routine or structure where they get the kid up, it's going to be a good day, we're going to have breakfast, and here's what we're going to do today, and then we'll have lunch, maybe we'll go to the park, maybe we'll go walking, maybe we'll read, maybe we'll spend some time bicycling or cleaning up the house. So structure, consistency of eating, and routine. So we established this routine. One of the things the virus has done is it's disrupted the routine. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't go to church on Sunday or Maybe if they do, it's online. So the structure and routine of these children and even adolescents has mm -hmm. been disrupted. It's been thrown kind of into chaos. It's, the world has become topsy-turvy, as one mother said to me. It's just kind of an ongoing stressful thing, and it's, it's stressful for the parents. And the children pick up on this anxiety and apprehension that the parents have. Uh, mom and dad want to know, you know, when is this going to be over? When can I go back to work? Uh, when can I resume kind of a normal activity or routine? Well, I have two grandchildren, and uh, they uh, were in school right up until the middle of March. Suddenly, they're at home. Right. They're not in school. They're each in their bedroom by themselves with a computer. And that's the only teaching they got from March until the end of school. Is that, isn't that kind of a hard way for a student to have to try to learn? Well, first of all, it's throwing them into a situation that they haven't been prepared for. I'm mm -hmm. going to steal a line from a movie. Okay. Uh, this is nothing that we were ever prepared for. <laughs> yeah. All of these restaurateurs, fast food places, they never prepared them for something like this in uh, undergraduate school. So we're all dealing with something that we have not really been prepared for. Um, going back to 9-11, you probably remember 9-11 oh, and the world, the world Trade Center. I mean, yes. that was nothing that anyone was ever prepared for. Who would have dreamt that we'd get up one day and the World Trade Center would be crashing down? But it's the same thing with this COVID-19. You know, you wake up one day and then all of a sudden kids have to go home and they're on the internet, even teachers, they had to um, teach on this Zoom thing, which is a good kind of face-to-face -face thing. Uh, there's mm -hmm. some interaction, there's some support, and kids can at least see the faces of the other children or their peer group. And that's kind of an important thing because again, they're kind of been ripped from that structure, consistency, and routine of the school setting. So we're doing the best we can in this situation, and it's something that hopefully um, we'll get through because I was talking in one class about, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, that was a saying from Alfred Adler, although one of my undergraduates said that that was actually Zac Efron mm. in one of those mm. movies. But we are all in this together. We're all kind of dealing with the lines. We're all dealing with the stress. We're all dealing with the change. And not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, not knowing uh, whether things will be lifted tomorrow, not knowing if we'll be able to go into our favorite restaurant tomorrow. Many of my friends on Facebook are teachers. Yeah. And they, some of them actually seem almost frightened. I mean, they're, they're just as, as upset as the children are. Sure. Uh, are. Are there some things that you might, some advice that you might have, having been in education for so long, uh, advice for teachers? Probably consistent contact as much as possible. Teachers are going to have to take the initiative and reach out. Uh, I mean, I send emails to students. 
Uh, if I have their phone number, we'll give them a call. If I see them, you know, even with a mask in Walmart, I'll, mm -hmm. you know, reach out and say, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How are you coping? I mean, this is the basic bottom line. How are people coping, whether it's you or your camera person or the person at All Sips or McDonald's, how are they coping with this uh, situation? They may have lost, you know, their job. Uh, they may have lost the regular paycheck, which is a real problem because some people are living paycheck to paycheck and uh, for things to be disrupted. Um, all of a sudden, bills aren't being paid and people are in a fearful kind of situation or status that they're in. Sometimes it's nice to have somebody friendly speak to you, isn't it? <laughs> somebody that, that is kind and understanding mm -hmm. and nurturing and that will help you um, talk about your feelings about all of the things that have happened. And, you know, we've had a little bit of false expectations done in that when this started in March, we thought, well, maybe, maybe mid-May, maybe June, this will be over. And here we are sitting July 15th. Yes. And we're still amazing. Yeah. talking about it and um, even entering the building. I had to put my face mask on, mm -hmm. I had to get my temperature taken, I had to fill out the form. I do that every morning. Every morning. Coming and into work. Yes. This is kind of what they call the new normal that we kind of have to adjust to. And for some people, they readily adjust to it, and for other people, it's not so easy because they've been doing things in a certain way for a certain amount of time. So they're in a little bit of a transition phase Right. There are some things that people do uh, to make a difference in the, in the stress that they're facing that are really not good for them. Um, some will take some sort of drug. Yeah. Maybe they, they got some pain reliever five years ago from the dentist. All of a sudden, they're going to try that. Yeah. Not a good idea. Not a good idea because the medical services are already kind of stretched to the limit. Mm -hmm. um, so people need to be careful. Uh, one of the negative things that you're probably aware of is that we're all kind of overeating. Mm -hmm. I mean, after this is over, <laughs> I've got to get back to Greyhound Arena and go to noontime basketball and start yeah. losing some of these pounds that I've been putting on over the last couple of months. Yeah. But uh, yeah, some people will maybe turn to a little alcohol or wine or yes. beer or something like that and in mm -hmm. an attempt to try to cope. And, and there's positive ways of coping, reading, working out, bicycling, maybe fishing or a hobby or cleaning the house. And then you have other negative kinds of things like you mentioned, drugs and... Well, I see lots of, of jokes sometimes on, on Facebook and, and other social media places talking, they kind of laugh, two ladies are getting together and gonna have two more glasses of wine, yeah. this kind of thing. It may be funny, but it's not going to end funny if you really do it. Correct. And also, you know, if you drink too much and you get to stop for drinking under the influence or get in a car accident, you know, those things are really problematic. People need to be aware of the impact of taking drugs and what that does to them and the addictive properties of some things like oxycodone. What are some things that uh, parents can do to help teachers that are going to try to get their children back in, in August? That's an easy question to answer. <laughs> One word, and it's read. Ah. Parents can read to their child. Parents can read with their child. Parents can encourage their child to read. I was in one fast food restaurant the other day, and one of the servers was reading The Three Musketeers. Ah. <laughs> which is one of the classic books of all time. And I really encourage this kid that I'm, I was glad to see him reading. But parents need to be really actively involved in just having uh, the child read, having books available for them, having magazines, even the newspaper, uh, things to read, crossword puzzles, stuff like that, anything that will kind of keep them intellectually stimulated and challenged during this time period. I have uh, taught as well, and uh, I, with my grandchildren, when they, they get kind of bored, if I happen to be staying with them, I like to actually play a part. For instance, if we're, if we're going to read The Three Musketeers, uh, 
I'll let my grandson be D'Artagnan, uh-huh. you know, and we'll have a sword fight, and yeah, he'll beat me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, that's a great suggestion, though. I, I really think the reading is, is a wonderful thing. And uh, w- what do you say to children who say, are we going to go back to school, but we really don't know yet? Well, we really don't know yet, but we are in the planning stages. Huh. Most people don't know about this, but statewide, there are all kinds of Zoom meetings going on. There are all kinds of information coming down from Santa Fe. Uh, the people here locally are in meetings, getting involved, talking, discussing, looking at options, trying to figure out the best way to almost stagger and prepare both the teachers and the students for that return, whether it be hybrid or whether it be alternative days or whatever. But I can assure you that there are a lot of emails going on. There are a lot of meetings going on preparing teachers for the return. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here. What you've, what you've sort of told me is something that's written on the front of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. Everything's going to be all right. Well, thank you for all that you're doing, by the way, for the state and helping out with getting education ready to go. We hope that it works soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh Uh-huh.